This next talk is titled, Cannabinoid Type 1 Receptor, an insight into G-protein coupled receptors. Recently, I got back from a trip where I was studying at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro with the Patricia Reggio Research Group. I had the pleasure of working with PhD student Isra and research scientist Dow P. Hurst. They really helped me understand how G-protein coupled receptors work, specifically the cannabinoid type 1 receptor. So this video is a thank you to those research scientists. This is the cannabinoid type 1 receptor. When one ingests or smokes marijuana, THC binds to this receptor, which produces intoxication. If this doesn't sound familiar, you should go back and watch my videos labeled A Chemist's Perspective of How Drugs Work. It will help you understand these videos, which are a bit complicated. This receptor has seven transmembrane helices, much like all G-protein coupled receptors. Helix number one is labeled in orange. Helix number two labeled in yellow. Helix number three is also labeled in yellow. Helix number four is in green. Helix number five is also in green. Now, if we take the receptor and spin it 180 degrees, we can see helix number six in blue, helix number seven in purple, and there is this small helix number eight, which does not cross the plasma membrane, but rather sits inside of the cell, labeled in purple. The cannabinoid type 1 receptor has three distinct binding sites, labeled in green, red, and black. If I were to take that receptor and rotate it by 45 degrees, we could see that the binding sites are distinct or separate from one another. Let's talk about the first binding site. This is labeled in green. It is known as the orthosteric site. Drugs that bind to this site are compounds like THC, CP55940, or Ramonabond. Compounds that bind to this site often produce intoxication and can act in one of two ways. They can act as agonist, turning the receptor on, or antagonist, which turn the receptor off. This next site is known as an allosteric PAM site. Allosteric just means other, and PAM means positive allosteric modulator. What this site does is if we were to bind a drug to this site on the receptor, whatever is bound to the orthosteric site will act stronger, thereby potentiating the effects of whatever drug is bound to the orthosteric site. The allosteric agopam site can act in two different ways. Drugs that bind to this site can act as agonist, which is the ago abbreviation, but they can also act as PAMs or positive allosteric modulators. The idea here being that all of the distinct binding sites on the cannabinoid type 1 receptor can have various effects, which makes it quite complicated. The cannabinoid type 1 receptor, much like any G protein coupled receptor or a light, can be in the off state, which is the shape that the receptor occupies when it is turned off or the on state, which is the shape that the receptor occupies when it is turned on when an agonist binds to it. Because it is hard to see the differences, in the next slide we'll overlay or superimpose the two images to look at the differences between the off state and the on state of the receptor. This first image is the inactive state in red, superimposed on top of the active state in green, looking from the top down of the receptor. Basically, if I took the last set of PowerPoint slides and rotated the receptor 45 degrees down, this would be the viewing angle of the top of the helices. And we can look at the differences in terms of what changed going from red to green, inactive to active. The first most noticeable thing that changed is transmembrane helix number two gets kicked in a little bit and transmembrane helix number one gets kicked in a little bit. Basically, what's happening is the top of the receptor is closing when a drug binds to the orthosteric site. If we look at the bottom of the site, 
something quite interesting is happening. We said the top of the receptor closes a little bit when an agonist binds to it. But if you look at transmembrane helix number six from the bottom of the receptor, it gets kicked out, which makes more space inside the bottom of the receptor. So the basic point here is that the top of the receptor closes and the bottom of the receptor opens when an agonist binds to it. The following phenomenon happens among all G protein coupled receptors. It is known as the Salpridge or ionic lock. On the third helix of the CB1 receptor, or any G protein coupled receptor, there is an arginine. This arginine at pH 7 is positively charged as the positive charge resonates back and forth between each of the nitrogen atoms. On the sixth helix, there is an aspartic acid. It is negatively charged. That negative charge resonates back and forth between the oxygens on the molecule. A negative and a positive, much like a magnet, attract each other and hold together. The force of attraction is known as an ionic lock or salt bridge. The ideal bond length for this is about four angstroms. In this picture, we'll notice that it is 3.39 angstroms, the bond on the left, and on the right, the bond length between the atoms is 5.27 angstroms, ideal for an ionic lock in which those two atoms are held together and the helices are fairly close to each other. Among activation of the receptor, an agonist causes the salt bridge to break, which causes helix 6 to be pushed back. We can notice the bond length between the atoms is now 9.22 angstroms and 7.43 angstroms. Being that the ideal bond length for a salt bridge is 4 angstroms, in the active state, these bonds are too far away from each other and the bond will break. And we will see the consequence of that happening. When an agonist attaches to a G protein coupled receptor, we talked about the idea that the ionic lock between arginine and aspartic acid breaks, which causes helix 6 to get pushed back, opening the bottom of the receptor. The opening of the bottom receptor is so that this large thing called the G protein can attach to the receptor. In image number one, I have placed everything in van der Waal radii, which is a more accurate depiction of what the receptor might look like. In blue, we see the CB1 receptor. In pink, we see the G alpha subunit of the G protein, which attaches to the receptor upon activation. The G protein also has a G beta subunit in gold and a G gamma subunit in black. Picture two just shows us something quite interesting. It shows us the following. This alpha five subunit is what inserts itself into the bottom of the receptor upon activation. If you'll notice, it doesn't insert itself that far into the receptor bottom part. It moves up by six angstroms, which is really just the distance between one alpha helical turn. It is not that much and rotates approximately 60 degrees to engage the core of the receptor. Although there is more to this whole process, we'll save that for a later video and summarize what we talked about thus far. The receptor first exists in its inactive state where the drug is floating around in solution. Upon the drug binding to the orthosteric site of the receptor, we talked about the idea that the top of the receptor closes and the bottom of the receptor opens. The bottom of the receptor opening is due to the ionic lock between arginine and aspartic acid breaking, which pushes helix 6 back, making room for the G protein to bind. In this step, the sixth helix is pushed back so that the alpha-5 helical subunit can bind up inside the bottom of the receptor, which causes a cellular signaling cascade that we'll get to in a later video. If you want to learn more and be able to imagine these, there are molecular modeling programs that you can direct message me about and I would be happy to show you how they work. Till then, hope you learned a lot.